So with that, I invite you to take your Bibles out and open them up to John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3. You might remember Cyrus. Cyrus was the great Persian king. He's mentioned in the Old Testament by a few of the authors, such as Isaiah. But in the annals of the great Persian kings, kings there is a story about the wife of one of Cyrus's generals. And so this wife was charged with treason. And after the trial, she was content, condemned to die. And so when her husband heard the news, he immediately just went bursting into the throne room, threw himself on the floor before King Cyrus and just cried out, Oh, Lord. And you just got a picture. He's just thrown on the ground here, just in great humility and just groveling. But he said, Take my life instead of hers. Let me die in her place. And Cyrus, who by all historical accounts, including the Bible, was a very humane and sensitive man, he was just touched by his offer. And he said, love like that must not be spoiled by death. And so he gave the husband and the wife back to each other and just let the wife go free. And as they walked away, happily obviously, the husband said to his wife, did you notice how kindly the king looked upon us? when he gave us that pardon. And his wife looked at him and she said, I had no eyes for the king. I saw only the man who was willing to die in my place. And every wife here should go, oh, is that not precious? That was a precious moment. But that's a love story, and it's a true story from history, but I really think it captures the spirit of something that we read about John the Baptist right at the end of chapter three. John the Baptist. Referring to his role in the great drama of salvation, here's what he said, verse 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. And what's happening here, just this little snapshot, John is shining the spotlight on what the Bible means. And the Bible speaks of this a lot. But he's shining the spotlight on what the Bible means, that Jesus Christ is the great lover, bridegroom, husband, and provider of his bride, the church. Because Jesus is the one who didn't just offer himself in our place, but who actually died in our place. And so as his bride, we the church, as his bride, our eyes and our hearts and our minds and our souls should just be fixed on him. That's what John is saying here. And so John the evangelist, it's confusing the same names, but John, the man who wrote this gospel, he would have us apply this bride and bridegroom theme to ourselves, the church the bride of Christ. But before we, need, before we do that, though, we really need to see what this particular passage teaches about Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. And this is incredible, incredibly important because John the Baptist was saying this, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So when John the Baptist applied this image of the bride, or for the bridegroom to Jesus, he was just reaching deep into the Old Testament and all of that imagery because in the Old Testament and we'll kind of take a quick tour but Jehovah God the God of Israel is frequently depicted as Israel's bridegroom the husband so John's not just making up this comparison here he is applying God to Jesus and we see the first hint of God being Israel's bridegroom in the book of Exodus and I'm just gonna read a quick passage God here is telling Israel in the context of giving them the law, this, Exodus 34, he says, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Do not make any idols. So let me just stop right there. So Jehovah God is the bridegroom or the husband of Israel. Now, it does, this passage does not spell that out explicitly, as you can see, but it is very implied in the argument that for Israel to worship any other god is what? That's prostitution. That's harlotry. That's whoredom, depending upon what version you're looking there in your Bibles. And now here's the thing. 
If anybody in this room right now has ever been a lovebird, do we even use that word anymore, lovebirds? Seems like an old thing. If anybody here is in love, has ever been in love, I'll tell you something you know about, and that is jealousy. Isn't that amazing? You know, you let a boy like a girl, a girl like a boy, and if one of them likes the other one more than, you know, it seems like it always happens that way, but there's jealousy when they see, they see that one they really love kind of looking over, casting their gaze, giving their heart to somebody else. Worse than that, Lovers definitely understand the devastating blow of cheating. You know, when it goes from just jealous that that might be happening to it's actually happened. And so with that, God is depicted right here. And we'll go look at some more, but he's, you can just see right here, God experiences the very powerful emotions towards Israel, the same as a husband would experience towards his wife or a wife towards her husband. And so we just see right here that unfaithfulness, adultery, those things cut him to the quick. Let's go a little deeper in the Old Testament. By the time we get to the book of Deuteronomy, the warning to Israel against committing spiritual adultery, it's much more explicit. In fact, we find, we find it in a prophecy that God gave to Moses just before Moses died. In fact, God tells Moses, you're getting ready to die. I hope God doesn't just tell me that. You're getting ready to head off on a trip. Oh, Todd, by the way, you're probably going to die all the way here. But anyway, God tells Moses he's going to die. And let's read Deuteronomy 31. And the Lord said to Moses... Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people, speaking of Israel, this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Well, let's go a little further. It's getting a little more explicit here. By the time we get to the books of the prophets in the Old Testament, we learn that Israel already did that. They went out and whored after all the other gods in the region. They forsook their jealous God, the covenant, the marriage covenant that he made with them to be their God and them his bride. They just flaunted that and they went off and prostituted themselves. And we go on in the language of God being the bridegroom to his bride, Israel. It becomes even more specific. For instance, Isaiah writes, Isaiah 54, 5, God says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Several chapters later. Isaiah again says, Isaiah 62, 5, And the bridegroom, speaking of himself, rejoices over the bride, or as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And from that point on in the Old Testament, the, the comparison occurs. That comparison of God being their husband, being their bridegroom, they being his wife, it is frequent from that point to the end of the Old Testament. We see it over and over in Jeremiah. We see it in Ezekiel. And then finally, the entire personal story of Hosea, if you know that. That, that whole story is about that theme. And so in all of these books, God is the faithful lover and husband, and Israel is the unfaithful wife and bride. And so with that little background from the Old Testament, we put that imagery into the context of what John the Baptist preached. And we find that John is clearly identifying the Lord Jesus Christ with God. Because John knew that Israel was the bride and Jehovah was the bridegroom. And so now John appears, or Jesus rather, appears on the scene and John immediately casts him in God's role. He's just basically saying, Jesus is God. And you might say, well, we know that, Pastor. You know, well, no, you don't. Or no, I don't. We tend to forget that over and over. That is one of the most misunderstood concepts, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The only way you and I know God, the only way we can relate to God is through Jesus Christ, who is the physical manifestation for us. I mean, when we get to heaven, you know, we often say that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to go see them or that or the other. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to go see God. But when I look around for God, and there's only one God, right? But remember, the confusion of the Trinity, God is eternally present as Father, Son, and Spirit. Of the three persons of the Godhead, of the three persons of the Trinity, you tell me, what's the only one that has a physical body that you could see with eyes? Jesus. When we get to heaven and we look for God, we are going to see Jesus. We only know God through Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh. He is the God-man. And so, you know, you think about mathematics. Here's a silly little example. But in mathematics, just what you really wanted to see this morning, uh, when you have two equations like A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, 
don't raise your hands, but some of you want to raise your hand and go, Pastor Todd, that kind of stuff gave me a headache when I was in school. I don't want to see it at church. You know, you're like, okay, no, wait a minute. And then there's certain per people who love math. They're going, yes, and I get it. God is Jesus. I can see it as clear as A equals B, you know. And so anyway, there's my little illustration. There. The rule is that things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And it's just my goofy way of saying that if Jehovah God is the bridegroom, and Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. Well, it follows that Jesus is who? He's Jehovah God. Jesus is God. And let me just quickly apply it personally and just ask, is he your God? Is Jesus your bridegroom? And I'll come back to that. Let me just lay that aside because we need to look now at the second major teaching from this passage, John 3, 29, of the bride and the bridegroom, that imagery. And it's of the high calling of the church. The high calling of the church. The church is the one for whom Christ died. She, us, we are married to Jesus Christ. Consequently, she's called to be what? Faithful. Just that, faithful. The Apostle Paul develops this imagery several ways in his writings. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes of his concern that the church that he founded in the city of Corinth would prove unfaithful to her bride or to her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. Let me just read it, 2 Corinthians 11. I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then in the very next verse, Paul shows that unfaithfulness occurs whenever the church adopts one of these three attitudes another Jesus a different spirit or a different gospel and do you see what that means do you see what that means it means that the church of Jesus Christ can be faithful oh but she can also be unfaithful she can commit spiritual adultery and she commits adultery whenever she departs from the Jesus of the Bible whenever she departs from the spirit of Jesus revealed in the Bible, or three, whenever she departs from the gospel of salvation by faith in Christ alone. Now let me just ask, has the church, do you think the church has ever done that? The church has been around 2,000 years, it's around right now, our church, many others, but just the church at large, individual church, have we ever done that? Well, let me just say before we answer, that is a question that should be asked afresh in every single age. If there are church people alive, they should be asking, are we doing that? Are we committing those three things? Do we have another Jesus? Do we have a different spirit? Do we have a different gospel in our churches? And I believe, with the exception of some faithful churches, that honesty would force us to admit today, this has indeed happened in our age. It is happening. So another Jesus. There is another Jesus that is being promoted from countless pulpits today in America. I'll give you some examples. The liberal's social Jesus, social Jesus, right? He preaches only love without any demands, without any judgment. That's the social Jesus. And then you got the progressives today. The progressives have a, have a social justice Jesus. And social justice Jesus, he narrows his message to fixing society's problems. And by the way, society's problems were brought, brought on primarily by white oppressors. That's social justice Jesus. Well, then you got the Christian right Jesus. He's political Jesus, and he's out there, the political right Jesus. He is concerned with taking America back for Christ, right? There's another Jesus. Oh, then you got the mega churches, life coach Jesus. And life coach Jesus, he is ultra concerned with helping their, his followers have their best life now. And you can find a million books on the bookshelf, and your life coach Jesus is going to help you have a better life now. Kind of a heaven on earth mentality. Oh, then you got the charismatics, champion Jesus. And champion Jesus, I'll tell you, and I want to sign up for him. I'll follow him because he's going to move your mountains. And he's going to fill your pockets and he's going to cure your cancer. Champion Jesus. And so, yes, we definitely have another Jesus in our churches today. And that means that we are committing spiritual adultery. We have fashioned a make-believe Jesus to our liking. It doesn't look anything about the authentic Jesus, the historical Jesus of the Bible. But many, many people are following another Jesus. How about a different spirit? Different spirit. Well, the last hundred years or so in America really have seen the mass takeover of a different spirit in many of our churches. 
And it really goes back to the early 1900s when what we call Pentecostalism was born in California. Uh, that multiplied into just what we call the ubiquitous charismatic movement today. And there's some great things in charismatic churches, and yet there's some chaos that comes as a direct result of this ubiquitous different spirit that has spread throughout many, many churches that have been, have been influenced by that. And we really see that the Apostle Paul's words to the church in Corinth were prophetic. Let me read it again. He says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And we just see today in America, playing the whore, the church has fallen for the, the devil's cunning deception. Many, many of the charismatic teachings regarding the Spirit, regarding the Spirit, if you just look into those simply and read into that, I mean, read their writings, you can listen to their leaders, it is an odd, strange mix of Eastern mysticism, like transcendental meditation and things like that, Quaker inner light theology, and then the ancient Gnostic heresy that we read about in the pages of the New Testament. And it's basically this. It's the idea that salvation is mixed with an inner experience of enlightenment that you tap into through this special revelation from the Holy Spirit. And great emphasis is placed on the individual self. I'm talking about you personally. You play a very, very big role in churches that have embraced another spirit. So a lot of emphasis is placed on your personal, private leadings by the spirit. And by the way, those are often just totally untethered by the final revealed word of God, the Bible. So Kenneth Hagin, maybe you've heard of him. Kenneth Hagin from right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he is the spiritual grandfather of, of many, many word of faith preachers who have spread another spirit. And you can read Kenneth Hagin's books. It is literally like reading the sacred writings of Hindus, Buddhists, and Gnostics. And the spirit that he describes just right there on the pages, it is most definitely a different spirit than the one that is revealed in the Holy Word of God. Today's different spirit it encourages Christians to follow private leadings, visions given directly. Again, it's to you, you know. It's, it's just to you, and you're not even worried. It's like, did you read that in the Bible? No, but I felt it. And that different spirit is leading people to do that instead of follow the clear statements of the Word of God. Today's spirit-led life movement, it's not about the Holy Spirit pointing us to the teachings of Jesus Christ in Scripture. It's not about the Holy Spirit constantly pointing us to Jesus Christ, standing in the background. Here's what you see in the Bible. Every time you see the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit in the Bible has a chance to stand in the shadows, get off center stage, to get out of the spotlight, he will do that every time. And guess who he is pointing to every time? To the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said. He is, it's like I, he is uncomfortable with being in the spotlight. That is not his role. That is not his goal. He wants to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what was my earlier question? How can you know God? How can you relate to God? What is the only way that you can relate to God? Through whom? Through his son, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit loves to shine the spotlight on our bridegroom. Our eyes are on him. We don't care what the king did. We want to look at the one who loved us enough, not to say I'll, not just to say he would die for us, to, but to actually die for us. And so today, this spirit-led life movement, this another spirit that has taken over many churches, it's all about us receiving inner experiences. That we don't even know where they came from. Oh, but then we're good because we're churchy. We know how to make it sound good. We baptize it all and say it all came from the Holy Spirit. And this has led to endless chaos in people's lives and in churches. I'm just simply saying a, a different spirit, another spirit, is alive and well and is deceiving people today. So how about a different gospel? How about a different gospel? Well, yes, absolutely a different gospel has emerged today. And one way we see it is, is in the prevailing trend that mixes works with faith for salvation. It's what we call works Righteousness. Now, most churches will not say that you have to go do something to get right with God. But instead of openly declaring free grace through Jesus Christ alone, churches will promote a moralistic, therapeutic deism. And what I mean by that is just believe in God. Yeah, pastor, I want to believe in God. Be a good person. Do good things. Do the right thing. Serve your fellow men. Yeah, I want to do all that. And when you do all that, 
you'll feel better about yourself. And, and when it's all said and done, you'll go to heaven. God will just let you on into heaven. And that's what we see. That's what we see happening all over the place. Uh, another manifestation of a different gospel is seen in the cool new slogans. Maybe you've heard some of these things. They just come right out of these churches that have another Jesus and a different spirit. And you've got these, these slogans that you, you see them in books. You hear them in sermons. It's a be the gospel. You heard that one? Live the gospel. You heard that one? Or I've even seen this one. The church needs to join Jesus in the gospel. Now let me just say this. First of all, those slogans don't even make theological sense at all. In fact, they're just stupid. I, I, what's the gospel? What is the gospel? We need to know what the gospel is. The gospel, let me just tell you, it, the gospel is the facts surrounding the life, death, and resurrection of whom? Who are we celebrating here? Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel is a historical event. I just mean it happened in history. It occurred on a certain day. There was a real day on the calendar roughly 2,000 years ago and Jesus Christ was killed for your sins and mine. Put in a tomb for how many days, church? Three days and God raised him from the dead. And for how many days did he walk the earth in his brand new resurrected body? Anybody remember? Forty whole days. Hundreds of people had an opportunity to see him. Evidence spread. You know, Paul wrote later, he goes, you can just go talk to people all over the Holy Land. Man, they saw him. They saw him. The gospel is the facts surrounding the life and death of Jesus Christ. It's a historical event. And it's why Jesus said on the cross, what did he say right at the end? It is what? Finished. He's just talking about the facts of the gospel of his life. The gospel is not something that you can go out and be. It's not something you can go out and do. It's not something you can go out and live. It's not something that you can go out and join with Jesus in. We're going to join with Jesus in. No, it, the gospel happened. And so what do church, it makes me wonder, what do churches mean when they say these cool new buzzwords? There's always cool new churchy buzzwords. What do they mean? Well, on one hand, they're just trying to sound cool. It's cool to sound cool in America. So on one hand, they're just trying to sound cool with these buzzwords like be the gospel, live the gospel, do the gospel, join Jesus with the gospel. They're just trying to sound fresh and edgy and relevant on one hand. But on the other hand, they're just falling for the devil's seduction. That's what they're doing. It's the same old lie from the Garden of Eden that we can do something to contribute to our salvation. We can do something. Jesus isn't enough. Oh, he's good, and he's wonderful, and he's necessary. But, but I don't need to do everything he says. Kind of like, kind of like the serpent said to Eve. You know, oh, do you really believe what God said, the, the serpent said? You know, no, no, no. With this, with this new gospel, this different gospel, we get to be or live or do or join Jesus. We get to. And it's all about us in the end. And it is a different gospel entirely, which saves no one. The gospel, again, is something that Jesus Christ accomplished in history. So what do we do now? The gospel has happened. What do you do? We repent of our sins. We place our belief in who Jesus is and what he did. What he did to turn away God's wrath from you and me, sinners. And what Jesus did to impute his righteousness or to give his righteousness, to transfer his righteousness to us. It's not just that we're forgiven of our sins. We can walk boldly into the throne room of God. Boldly. Why? Because of any good thing in us? No, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has just been cloaked upon us. Jesus Christ did it all. That's what I'm saying. We simply believe and receive. And here's the thing. Any deviation from that, any perversion of that, any cool slant on the true gospel is simply a different gospel and it is sending people to hell all across our country. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. Charles Spurgeon was a great, a great Baptist preacher in England in the 1800s. And amazingly, that many years ago, he was dealing with people who loved to embrace another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. He just simply said this. He says, morality may keep you out of jail, but it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to keep you out of hell. And boy, never forget that. I don't care how good you are. I, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to jail, but I'd rather go to jail than go to hell. You know what I mean? And there's only one way to stay out of hell, and that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ for sinners like you and like me. And so each of these three things are present today. Another Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. And it is all what the New Testament calls apostasy. And the church today is overly or just overwhelmingly unfaithful to her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
third major teaching of the bride and bridegroom imagery from John 3 is about sex and marriage, about sex and marriage, and specifically the issue of sexual morality and then the standards for a Christian husband and wife, a Christian marriage. And this, do I even need to say that this is crucial to get straight in our day? Because we now live, I mean, American society, as you know, we've just turned our values upside down. The traditional norms when it comes to human sexuality, when it comes to the standards for a Christian marriage, my, my, just totally cast all that aside and faithfulness in marriage is losing its appeal. But let me just ask this. Why is it, why is it that promiscuous sexual relations and unfaithfulness in marriage are wrong? Why are those things wrong? There's three major reasons. Let me just quickly hit on these. First of all, these things are wrong simply because God says so. But we need to just bow down to that. God says so. Let me just remind you, that which is right is right, and that which is wrong is wrong. Not because you and me judge it to be right or wrong, but because good Good at its purest sense is related to the very character of God himself. God's character is the morality of the universe. Doesn't matter what you think about it. Doesn't matter how I feel about it. God's character sets the whole morality for the whole universe. And so therefore, if God tells us that something is wrong, it is wrong. It doesn't matter what we feel about it personally. The second reason why promiscuity or unfaithfulness is wrong is that these things aren't good for us as God made us. They're not good for us as God made us. So, again, it's true that right is right and wrong is wrong because God says so, but it's equally true that morality is related to the way we're made. There's, there's, in other words, there's a, there's a reason, there's a point to God's morality with how he made us. And so what this means practically for your life is that you are never happier. You are never happier than when you are obeying God's laws. It's just as simple as that. Now, you and I, we resist that. We, we don't believe it. We don't want to believe it. But it's the truth. And then conversely, you will find yourself on an increasingly destructive path in your life. Any and every time that you flout God's laws. It just, when you just ignore them and cast them aside. That is the consistent message of the prophets of the Old Testament. They, here's their message over and over to the people of Israel. Obey and be blessed and disobey and be what? cursed. I used to tell my kids all the time, if you break God's laws, it's, you know, it's fun being a dad sometimes. You got these little guys scared, you know. Let me just tell you. If you break God's laws, they will break you. You know, and boy, I really, they will. And that wasn't just a ploy from a dad because I have to remind myself as a child of God of that all the time. If you break God's laws, they will break you. And that is a true maxim in the universe for this reason. God created it all. And what I mean by all is the world, the physical laws that, we, that govern this life in this world. Uh, God also created us human beings and then the moral laws that govern us. So in other words, he did it all. And it fits together. And it all works together. And we can't get away from any of it. We can't get away from the physical laws such as gravity. We can't. We can't get away from the physical laws, such as if you tip over in a canoe. I thought about this one a couple of weeks ago. You tip over in a canoe and you get overwhelmed and hypothermic by the cold water. What might happen? You might just you know, lose control of your muscles and you begin to sink. Then you suck a bunch of water into your lungs and now you're a drowning victim. What went on there? Well, if that happens and if God used that, that just means God made the water. God made my lungs. God made natural laws. God made moral laws. It all works together is the point. We can't get away from that. And we can sin, right? We can sin. We do it every day. We can rebel against our maker all we want. We can break any of his laws. Have you noticed that? We can break all kinds of God's laws. Now, here's the thing about God. He is incredibly patient. It's not often that he comes back and begins to break us immediately. Praise the Lord for his patience. But I'll tell you, the breaking will come. It can't not come. Because God is never inconsistent within his own nature. So on the positive side, we human beings, from how God shaped us and placed us in this world that he created, we are never more blessed. We are never happier. We are never more content. We are never more joyful than we just simply do things his way. Have you noticed that? I'll tell you this. There's not one instance of fornication 
There's not one instance of adultery. There's not one instance of marital unfaithfulness that ever lived up, up to its hype. Ever. Ever. Now, again, the breaking, it might not have been endured right in that moment, but regret and pain always follow. And, and you might say, well, I don't know about that. Well, let me tell you, if it didn't happen in this life, I'll guarantee you the misery on Judgment Day, it's going to bring it all right back up. It never, ever lives up to the hype. Now, the opposite, conversely, every instance of a Christian who just believed God about these laws, and I'm just talking yet again about the laws of sexual morality, the laws of faithfulness in marriage, and how to have, that's what we're talking about here, right? Every instance of a Christian who just believes God and remains faithful, they receive the full benefit of living the way God made them. They're never happier. They're never more at peace. They're never more content. Never more content. So the final and best reason why promiscuous sexual relations and marital unfaithfulness are wrong, we're just looking at three reasons why those things are wrong, and it's this. These things break the picture of what God intends marriage to be. They break the picture of what God intends marriage to be. Let me just ask a simple one. Who made men and women? We read it in Genesis 1, 1, or Genesis 1, rather. Who made men and women to live together in the marriage relationship? God did, right? God knew what he was doing. And then here's the point for today. He knew why he did that. It's not just so we can have a wife or have a husband and have kids. That's certainly a part of it. Well, let me just remind you that when eternity starts, we're not married anymore. It's, it's, it's this gift, this human gift of our human immediate families. It's a gift for this side of heaven. It doesn't go on. And so God has a reason for it. God has a point in it. And he knows what he's doing. Francis Schaeffer was a great cultural observer. He's been dead a couple of decades. But he gets at why. Why it is that God established the marriage relationship. Let me quote from Schaeffer. Marriage is set forth to be the illustration of the relationship of God and his people and of Christ and his church. The relationship of God with his people rests upon his character. And sexual relationship outside of marriage breaks this parallel which the Bible draws between marriage and the relationship of God with his people. And so women are wives. Who are they to love? Who's a wife supposed to love? Her husband, right? Just as Christ loves who? The church. Or rather, I'm sorry, as, as the church loves Christ. That's, that's the calling of a wife. Love your husband as the church loves Christ. And men, who are Christian men supposed to love? Their wife. How? As Christ loves his bride, the church. So Francis Schaeffer concludes with a reference to adultery. He says... If we break God's illustration by such a relationship, an adulterous relationship, it, it is simply it is a serious thing. And it is a serious thing. When two people cheat, it's not just about them, is it? It's not just about them. Uh, but we're told today, follow your heart, right? We're told things like that. We're told, live in the moment. We're told today that that we are most authentic as a human being when we embrace our feelings instead of being shackled by society's norms that want to put us in a corner. We're told all those things. We're taught all those things. And people, including church people, are acting on all of those messages from out there in the world. But here's the thing. When they believe it and when they take the step and become unfaithful, well, that doesn't just hurt their spouse. That doesn't just hurt their children. Those things are true. But what we're learning this morning from John 3 is that they are breaking God's most poignant illustration of Christ's love for his bride and his bride's love for him. They're breaking that. They're breaking that. And so how, how do we apply this major teaching about sex and marriage personally? How might we apply that? Well, it depends upon who you are, where you are on the spectrum of love, marriage, and sex. So for some of you, you're not married yet. Okay, you're not married yet, but you're thinking about it. You'll be thinking about it soon, maybe. If you are in this category, you must determine to hold up the highest possible standards of marriage. You've got to determine that early, early on. And then, well, here's what you do. You evaluate the one that you might be thinking of marrying in terms of that, right? So, young woman, you have got to look at your young man and ask, 
Can he be as Jesus Christ to me? Now look, we're not talking about perfection. You know this guy. You better know him. You better have spent quite a bit of time around him and known his character. And you need to ask before you get up here with me and before I you know, pronounce you husband and wife. Long before that, you need to say, can he be as Jesus Christ to me? And if you know the answer is not that, you can't do that, then you've got to look elsewhere. You've got to end it all and move on. And so, young man, you should ask yourself this. Do I love this young woman enough to give myself for her? Am I willing to just look past her faults in most cases? Am I willing to be patient with her as God instructs me to do, as Christ does for me every day? And then finally, am I willing to die for her? And young man, if you are not willing to do those things, it is not right for you to marry that girl. It's not right at all. So now others of you here this morning, you're obviously beyond thinking about marriage. You're already married, and God forbid there are difficulties in your marriage. And if you've been married, just they come. But you might have difficulty in your marriage right now. And if you find yourself in that category, here would be the application. Do not give up because of the difficulties. Do not give up because of the difficulties. Because if you do that, what you're really saying is that God gives up on us. What are we learning this morning? The marriage relationship is a real picture of what? The relationship between Jesus Christ and us, his bride, the church. Do you want Jesus to forgive you every time you mess up? Even when you really mess up? Do you, would you like that? I mean, that's, the, that's the gospel effect. But that's forgiveness, right? We want that. And so if you're in this category and you're thinking about giving up on your marriage, you can't do that because that just basically says God gives up on you and you don't want him to give up on you. You never want that. So instead of that, you've got to love with a love that overcomes difficulties. And so the first thing you do is you just work on changing yourself, work on winning your spouse over, go back to almost just the fundamental principles of, you know, do I love my husband like, like the church loves Christ? Or if you're a man, you know, am I willing to die for her? Am I willing to try my best to love like Christ loves? I think I'm missing up my points there, but you get my point there. You come right back to those fundamentals. You just yield to Christ and his standards. And what he will begin to do is change you. And without you even knowing it, deep beneath the scene, he will be also making things new in your marriage. And I could talk a lot more about that, but those are the basic principles. So quickly, because we need to close. Fourth and finally, fourth and finally, we're looking at the imagery or the theme of the bride and the bridegroom. It, well, let me just skip some stuff and just shoot right ahead. Fourth and finally, it teaches us about the return of Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus Christ. And we see this when we apply this bride and bridegroom theme to time. So time. We live in time. We live in what people call the space-time continuum of creation. And that just simply means, again, we're still speaking to brides and grooms. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. We, the church, are the bride. I know I keep repeating that. But that just means that we're still waiting for the final consummation, consummation of our engagement to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. We're waiting. What are we really waiting for? What do we call that in another context? The second coming, right? He's coming back. And he's coming for what? He's coming for the wedding. He's coming to get his bride. That's the marriage day. So as for now, we're still waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And let me just ask you, does, does a woman look forward to her wedding day? Raise your hand if you've been married. I don't care how many times. <laughs> Uh, my guess would be, hopefully, most of you were really excited on that. Of course, she looks forward to her wedding day. And so should we also look forward to the return of our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should act accordingly. That's the point here. That's the application. So let me just ask you, how should you live right now? How should you live as you wait for the coming of your bridegroom? Let me illustrate, which is quickly as we close with these two contrasting stories. So way back at the beginning of the First World War, there was a young aristocrat in England. He married and then went off to fight in the war. And his young bride wrote to him that she was busy with war work and she was nursing at a certain hospital there in England and she apologized for not writing more often. She said, I'm spending all these long hours every day tending to the war wounded and things like that. Well, sometime later when her husband was coming home on a leave, 
a friend of his who knew what was actually going on back at home, he said to him, listen, if I were you, I wouldn't write to her in advance that I'm coming home. I'd just simply slip back home quietly. And so the husband did so. And he went to the hospital where his wife was supposed to be working around the clock and found that nobody there even knew her name. And so he went to her apartment. Their apartment, right? They'd been married. And someone said, uh, oh, she's not here. She's probably down at the Ritz tonight. She's probably down there at the dance. And so the husband went there, and sure enough, he found his wife in the company of another man. And in time, he found out a good deal more about what she'd been doing. In fact, the British authorities granted him a divorce. So the other story is this. The beginning of the same war, World War I, here in the United States, there was a young couple. They had made plans to be married. Everything was ready. They already had bought a small cottage, had furnished that. The date was set for the wedding. Suddenly, war is declared. The young man was called up to active duty and would just be shipped off to France very, very soon. So on the day before he left, the young woman said to him, Look, I, I know that it's not yet the date of our wedding, but you're getting ready to be shipped overseas. And I hate to say it, honey, but you might die. It's war. You might die. And I would much rather go through life bearing your name than to go through life always having to explain that the man I loved was killed in war. And honey, I'm just saying this, let's get married. Let's just get married right now before you go. And so on the next day, they were married. And for their honeymoon, he shipped off to war in Europe, and the bride went alone to that little cottage. She's lonely, obviously, as you can imagine. She longed for the day when she would see her husband again, and day after day, he would write to her, and he would send her gifts. Months went by. And finally, she was just so lonely one day, she just sat down on the floor in front of the fireplace, pulled out all the gifts he had sent, just kind of going through each of them, reading through all of the letters again. You know how that is. She's not seen him in forever. And she's reading through all of that. She's just having herself a good cry. And suddenly, she hears something at the front door. It's a step. And then the door opens, and there he is standing right in the door. You see, he'd sent telegrams. If that's a different day, he could have sent a text or an email today. Today, telegrams, and often telegrams were slow. He got there before the telegram is the point. He got there ahead. But when she saw him and realized that he was home, and she jumped to her feet, actually broke some pottery he had sent from France. Some of the letters that were on her lap spilled into the fire, literally. You think she cared? He had returned to her. And having him, and she had everything. She didn't care about any of it because she had him. And brothers and sisters, I think you can see the point. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back. And he is going to find you and me in one of these two attitudes. So I just ask you simply, will you be flirting with the world when he comes back? Is that what he's going to find you doing? Or will you be occupied with his love letters, his gifts, his work? thinking of him because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Would you please stand to your feet? Thank you, God, for giving us an image of our relationship to Jesus Christ that we can get. We can grasp it. We can feel it. We can know it. Uh, every single one of us know about marriage and family, uh, and moms and dads and siblings. We get it and we know it. And God, to see who Jesus is for us. And then to see how unfaithful we are to him. God, all of us individually and then even collectively as a church, we're, we're not all that we should be. And God, we're sorry for that. And yet we just thank you for your unending grace and mercy towards us because of our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that in these closing moments, that, that as your spirit, your legitimate spirit who wants to shine the spotlight on Jesus Christ as he just moves through like a mighty wind. It settles upon our hearts. Lord, would we just offer ourselves up to you and allow you to change us and to move us to make whatever decisions we might need to make today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.